Hello, everyone, and welcome to World, um, happy World Water Day, everyone, and welcome to all who are participating in or attending our panel, Water and Climate Change, Risk and Resilience, here at Safe Water Network. I'm happy to share that we have over 840 people from over 35 countries joining us today. My name is Kyra Eubanks, and I'm the CEO of Kyra Speaks Kyra Writes LLC, a consulting ghostwriting and leadership development firm. In addition to being Miss Broward County for the Miss America organization, I'm also the youth representative of New Future Foundation to the United Nations and Youth Steering Committee member for the United Nations Department of Global Communications. As many of you may already know, the United Nations has laid out 17 sustainable development goals that nations must achieve to have a more sustainable future. And while today's event, Water and Climate Change Risk and Resilience on World Water Day falls under several of the 17 SDGs, today's event is also in line with SDG 6, Access to Clean Water. We're going to have a dynamic, engaging event covering many different topics from some amazing speakers. So please stay tuned and know that there will be opportunities for question and answer throughout the event. So please feel free to stay active and the Q&A function. All right, here are a few housekeeping rules and announcements. The chat function is off. So please use the Q&A feature to submit questions. Please note that this video will be recorded and shared after the event. I would like to pass the floor over to Kurt Sorlin, the founding CEO of Safe Water Network and a member of Safe Water Network's Board of Advisors for his opening remarks. Thank you, Cairo. Uh, welcome all to the second youth convening of Safe Water Network. It's terrific to know so many are actively engaged and interested in the issue of safe water. To see di today's discussion, I have a couple of brief comments. First, I'd like to acknowledge today being the 29th celebration of World Water Day. This year, the United Nations asks us to consider the value of water. As I contemplate the value of water, I think of the enormity of the challenge from the perspective of the 2 billion people every day struggle to access safe water. This struggle needlessly compromises the health and livelihoods of too many communities all over the world, including here in the United States where I live. Second, uh, I ask you to consider the many complexities of this challenge. Equitable, reliable access, affordability, source water sustainability, water quality, social and behavioral challenges, financing, and many stress factors inhibiting progress, politics, population migrations and growth, industrial factors, and of course, impact of climate. Like most of today's great challenges, while the need is obvious, solutions are riddled with complexity. The challenges are worthy of persistence, commitment, and, and sustained engagement. And it is in that spirit that I welcome you to this event, hopeful this will be an issue you engage in over a lifetime. Thank you all for joining and taking an interest. I particularly wanna thank our many accomplished guests who have agreed to take time to share their perspectives and engage in this discussion. I look forward to a terrific exchange of ideas. Thank you so much, Kurt. And now it is my absolute honor and pleasure to introduce Indra Nui, a woman of remarkable accomplishments. She's a former chairman and CEO of PepsiCo, a Fortune 50 company with operations in over 180 countries. Currently, Mrs. Nui sits as a board member of Amazon and is also a Dean's Advisory Council member at MIT School of Engineering. She was just recently inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame, along with Michelle Obama and Mia Hamm, and also has a memoir out in September, which we're all looking forward to reading. <sighs> Congratulations again, Mrs. Nuyi, for this incredible honor. And then following Mrs. Nuyi's remarks, we will have Isha Mittal come on for a brief Q&A with Mrs. Nuyi. Isha is a dynamic member of Safe Water Network's Youth Steering Group and a scholarship student at Virginia Commonwealth University, majoring in biology on the pre-medicine track. Isha actively contributes time as a youth ambassador in various philanthropic and commun community organizations. Welcome, Mrs. Nuyi. Thank you, Cairo, and thank you, Kurt, and thank you to Safe Water Network and to all of you on the Youth Steering Group for this invitation to be with you today at this vir virtual youth series. I must tell you that water is very personal to me because I grew up in a town that was extremely water distressed. So I feel the need for water deep down inside. 
And I've had the pleasure of knowing Safe Water Network literally since the beginning and want to applaud the impact you've had over the last decade, especially when I consider the topic of today, water and climate change. You know, for a long time, people had a lot of difficulty articulating the link between these two. I'm sure that scientists understood the challenge, but for many, there were really two camps, the climate change camp and the water security camp. And in many ways, they kept very separate. I've always believed that a lot of the real innovation, the disruptive ideas, the breakthroughs, don't come from looking at issues in a silo. They come from exploring the white spaces between the silos. And that's how we need to think in a systems way, as an independent society, interdependent society, living in an interconnected world, focused on collaboratively finding solutions. Now, once we find the solutions, it's also important that people hear about them. You know, one of the things that amazed me when I was in PepsiCo is that I would travel around the world and meet with so many people of diverse backgrounds and different cultures. And it's the ingenuity that people use to find solutions to problems on a very, very local level. So for example, I'd see a great new technique to conserve water at one of PepsiCo's plants in Pune in India. Then I'd travel to a similar facility in Lima, Peru and ask if they heard about the processes in Pune. And the chances were that they had not heard of it, Lima, Peru. So one of the things I instituted at PepsiCo with the help of many brilliant associates was the structure and culture that would allow us to lift and shift what works in one area and reapply it in another. Now, it sounds incredibly logical, especially for one company, but it's surprising how when you're running this huge enterprise around the world, there are so many ideas that bubble up in every country that they rarely get transferred. So we created a systematic process to lift and shift ideas. And what we discovered was when you do this co correctly, the impacts are exponential. And this is what I think we need to do for climate and water solutions. If you think of just the great ideas that came from one company like PepsiCo, and you multiply it by the millions of ideas and solutions that sit somewhere in the world, just waiting to be communicated, replicated and scaled. Just think about what a fantastic impact that could have in this whole issue of water in the world. You know, last year I was asked by Prince William to be part of the Earthshot Prize Committee. And this is exactly what the Earthshot Prize aims to do, to provide the platform for water and climate solutions to be collated, curated, communicated, and copied. And guess what? You actually get a prize for doing that right. Safe Water Network knows this very well. Kurt and his team have spent 15 years optimizing the solutions that, are, that work and are now sharing that knowledge with the broader sector to have others replicate what they have learned. And believe me, there should be no territoriality for these ideas. The magnitude of the combined challenge is much too great and the need for solutions is just urgent. Every single one of us on the Zoom session today has a role to play in solutions. There is a collective responsibility towards climate change, including corporate action. It requires leadership in government, it requires community action, and most importantly, individual action. Just look at what Greta Thunberg was able to do. And 12-year-old Seven Suzuki, 25 years earlier, who took leaders at the United Nations to task for the state of the planet. We witnessed a clear shift in the role the younger generations play. Rest assured, you not just have a voice, but that voice is being heard by the right people in the right place and in a way that's now leading to action. With your innovative thinking, your can-do attitude, with your appetite for risk that many people in the older generations just don't have, your generation has begun to act on and shape the response to climate water security. I encourage you to take charge and own the future of the planet and the well being of your brothers and sisters around the world. I'd like to close with a quote from a cultural anthropologist, Margaret Mead, who said Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has.
It's the only thing that is ever that ever has. Every one of you can be part of those thoughtful, committed citizens. And every one of you can be part of the solutions that are so desperately needed. And I know in my heart that you will collectively find the solutions to make the world a better place. Thank you. Good morning, how are you? Very good, how are you, Isha? I'm doing good. Um, I wanted to start off by first congratulating you on being inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame this year. It is an honor that's, it's an honor truly well-deserved as you have been such an inspiration for young women around the world, including myself. So my first question to you is, if you could give one piece of advice to all young women out there, what would that piece of advice be? What is the message that you want to give to them? I'm going to give two pieces of advice, Aisha. The first is that um, um, the world is yours. I mean, you're the younger generation. We're all stewards of the world for you. So don't wait till you become our age to take over. Stand up, speak up, be counted. Um, all the things we do wrong as our generation, try to make it right. Because, um, you know, I always view myself as a caretaker of the world for my two children. And so please do not let your voices be silenced. Do not uh, be apathetic, get involved, lean in. So that's my first piece of advice. The second is, please be a lifelong student. There's so much to read, there's so much to learn, there's so much to absorb. There's so much to do in terms of systems thinking. You have to read, you have to read everything. Go out of your bubble and read, absorb, draw pictures, draw shapes. Uh, it's very exciting out there. So look at the world as uh, you know, full of optimism rather than, oh my God, these problems are all so huge. They're not. If you really focus on addressing them, you'll actually feel great that you're making a difference in the world. Wow, those are such powerful pieces of advice. I'll definitely keep that in mind. <laughs> so during your tenure as PepsiCo's CEO, you transformed the company with a vision of performance with a purpose. You are an innovative leader that truly planned for the future by investing in sustainability, introducing healthier products, um, and creating an inclusive work environment. So based on those experiences, what would you say that how, about how older and younger generations can come together to bring about the most innovative solutions for society? So I'm, I'm going to expand this question again, Isha, because I think it's a wonderful question. Um, it's the older and younger generations, but it's also governments, companies, communities, all coming together. I think ecosystems have to come together. Uh, the older and younger generation, it's interesting. Performance with Purpose in PepsiCo became um, implementable and really took steam because the younger people were energized by it. Younger people were searching for purpose. And they wanted to work for a company that embodied purpose. And when we articulated what our purpose was, which is transforming the portfolio, focusing on the environment, making PepsiCo a wonderful place to work for young people, young people came to work in PepsiCo in droves. Clearly, we have to deliver performance. Don't get me wrong. We don't get a buy on performance. It's how you do both. And so it's interesting that when we run the company for young people, recognizing that they're our future, we do all the right things. Because you guys, you know, are really remarkable. I see it in my kids. I see it in all of you. Brilliant future generation. I feel great about the future of the earth. Um, let me now turn to uh, the other part. Companies are major forces in society. Governments can scale things up. Companies are very efficient. But communities are where the two have to meet. So just imagine if we could get communities, individuals, companies, and corporations to come together how much change we can make happen, how fast and efficiently at lower cost. So I think we should stop talking about, oh, the government should do this or companies should have done that or community should take care of it. I think we have to think about ways to come together because we all have a shared goal, making the world a better place, community by community, family by family. So if you approach it that way, I think I mean, again, as I said, Aisha, I feel positive about the future of the world. Yes, definitely. Thank you for that insight. So I'm sure as the first woman CEO of PepsiCo, you've encountered many obstacles in your career and your life. 
whether that be coming to America as an immigrant, um, finding the right balance between work and family, or leading a male-dominated workforce. So what would you say has been the most significant barrier in your career, and how did you overcome it? Um, when I started working, or when I came to the U.S. and I started to work, there were no women in the workforce. I've never had a female boss. Very few women I could look up to, handful. I've been in meetings where I was the only woman and there were tens and tens of men. So I think the times that I was in was very different. And as a consequence, um, I actually had an environment where people just respected me because I was such an anomaly, such a, a unique being among them. Among them. Uh, and so I didn't face the kind of issues that people today face, thank God. Um, and also, you know, I was married early and I had kids. So my focus was just doing a good job and going home. I never socialized with anybody because when you have kids at home, what's socializing? Um, and um, uh, that's, I don't drink. So that was another reason why not to socialize because how much water can you drink a whole evening? So I had these uh, nerdy behaviors that actually stood me in good stead. So I just went home and worked and read and studied and did my job better and better and better. So my time was different. Today is a whole different ball game. Today, first of all, everybody has a lot of distractions. We didn't. There was no internet when we were early in our workforce. So uh, we had no distractions. And um, I just worked awfully hard. Um, did I face bias? Did I face barriers? Yeah, I mean, I faced all of the normal issues of rolling the eyes, talking over me, but I shrugged my shoulders because I had the basic confidence that you couldn't do a better job than I was. So I know that you need me to do a good job. So it's okay, you can roll as many eyes as you want, you can talk over me as much as you want, but at the end of the day, the only way this project is gonna get done is if I get involved. So I had that confidence in me, which came from an enormous investment in competence. And that's very important. You've got to focus on building your competence, having a hip pocket skill. And if you don't have a go-to hip pocket skill, you won't be taken seriously. Thank you for that. I think we're running out of time now, so I'm gonna to start to hand it over. But again, thank you so much for being here today. It was so inspiring to meet you and talk to you and such an honor. Um, Congratulations. So yeah. <laughs> thank Good you. luck to you. And I have to say that it was truly remarkable having um, you know listened to that exchange, and it just made me even more grateful for organizations like Safe Water Network, who are solving the issues of safe water in countries like Ghana and India by developing locally owned and managed safe water stations. These were truly insightful and inspiring words that we're going to carry forward with us. Now, speaking of the mission, oh, you're so welcome. Now, speaking about the mission, I'd like to give you all a glimpse into Safe Water Network's mission and how critical this work is as we are increasingly facing some of the challenges that we have. Actor and philanthropist Paul Newman recognized that water would become one of the 21st century's highest priorities. That's why he co-founded Safe Water Network in 2006. Paul was right. Water is life's most precious necessity, and yet it's less safe, less reliable, and harder to reach due to threats such as climate change, population growth, and pollution. Today, more than two billion people around the world are in need of safe water. That number will increase unless we act now. Our small water enterprise model addresses a variety of water challenges and keeps safe water flowing in hundreds of communities in Africa and India. These locally owned and operated businesses can be rolled out quickly in areas of need. Sustainability is integrated into all aspects of our model. It starts with an environmental survey of existing sources to ensure watersheds are managed properly. Stations are designed to reduce their carbon and waste footprint through a number of innovations. Solar energy powers stations on and off the electrical grid. Reusable containers lessen the need for single-use plastics. Digital financial tools ensure that less water is wasted. 
non-potable water is recycled for cleaning, crops, and other uses. We also provide the ongoing training and support to maintain and improve operations for the long haul. When communities have safe, reliable water, mothers and children live happier, more prosperous lives. With your help, we can assist many more communities in need. Correct. Join us in fulfilling Paul Newman's vision of a world with safe water for all. What could be better than to hold your hand out to people who are less fortunate than you are? Safe water saves lives. Now, on to our speaker. I'm thrilled to introduce Janie Bavishi, the director of the New York City's Mayor's Office of Resiliency, which tackles the challenge of climate change through science-based analysis, policy and program development, and capacity building. She previously served the Obama administration. Janie and her team are literally trying to get New York City prepared for the year 2050. Welcome, Janie, and uh, just a reminder to please enter your questions in the Q&A function, and we're going to answer as many as we can live. Thanks so much, Cairo. Good morning uh, from New York. Happy World Water Day, everyone, and thank you so much to the Safe Water Network for holding this wonderful event today. Um, as Cairo mentioned, my name is Janie Bavishi. I'm the director of the New York City Mayor's Office of Resiliency, where I am responsible for preparing New York City for the impacts of climate change. Now, as some of you may already know, Hurricane Sandy was a pivotal moment in New York City's climate resiliency efforts. Almost 90,000 buildings were flooded. There were $19 billion in damages and lost economic activity, and 44 New Yorkers lost their lives. We know that, that a Sandy-like storm in the 2050s could cause $90 billion in damages. That's almost five times Sandy's impact, and most of that increase is due to the increasing intensity of Atlantic Ocean hurricanes fueled by climate change. As we prepare for climate change, we are not just preparing for extreme events like Sandy, but also the chronic impacts of climate change. We are preparing for sea level rise, which not only intensifies hurricanes, but can also ca cause flooding in communities during high tide, uh, what we call sunny day flooding. Uh, New York City also has 520 miles of coastline. That's more than Miami, Boston, Los Angeles, and San Francisco combined. And we expect that sea level rise will rise up to two feet by the 2050s, and those projections go up to six feet by the 2100s. We're also preparing for extreme heat, which often impacts the most vulnerable residents in our community, uh, including the elderly and chronically disabled and those who live in low-income communities. And we're preparing for intense precipitation, which can flood inland communities, areas that are often less prepared. So how are we tackling these challenges that climate change presents? New York City is investing over $20 billion in resiliency projects all over the city through a multi-layered strategy. We're building a new class of complex coastal infrastructure projects that will protect our coastal communities without walling ourselves off from the waterfront. We're upgrading our buildings to ensure that we're better prepared to withstand heat and flood impacts. We're hardening our critical infrastructure like transportation, energy, water, and sewer and telecommunications to minimize disruptions to services. And we're preparing, to, we're preparing our residents and businesses to make more informed decisions in the face of climate change. Now, these projects are extremely important, but they are just a start. We must remember that resilience is a process and not an outcome. We must continue to monitor the science and adjust our strategy to adapt to the impacts of climate change as we better understand them. And we collaborate with cities around the globe to share strategies and lessons so that we're not reinventing the wheel, but rather incorporating those lessons in our strategy. We must also, however, simultaneously integrate a consideration of climate risks across all of the city's actions and investments so that we're not advancing resilience projects in a silo, but ra rather mainstreaming resilience into everything we do. We had a great victory just last week here in New York City on that front. The City Council passed legislation that will require consideration of climate impacts in the design and construction of all city facilities and infrastructure, a portfolio of $90 billion. This is a massive step in our work to build a more resilient city. And this is what I want to leave, with, leave you with. If you're thinking about how you can help, please engage your leaders about how they are considering climate risks, not just in projects and decisions that are obviously related to climate change, but in any decision. Every land use and planning decision, every new housing development, and every infrastructure investment must take climate risks into account. 
ask your leaders about how they're doing this, push them, your voice matters. And this is ultimately how we will prepare our communities for climate change and build a culture of resilience going forward. I look forward to your questions. So the question that I have for you, Janie, um, is what are some key takeaways that we can use from the 2050 plan that can be used in other metropolitan cities outside of New York City? Yeah, Kyra, that's a great question. Um, and you know, I, I will say two things. One is um, just what I said in my remarks, we're really trying to incorporate consideration of climate risks across all city actions and investments. And I think um, we need to build a culture of resilience, not just in New York City, but in every metropolitan uh, area across the globe. Um, this is what it's gonna take to really rise to the challenge that climate change presents. So um, I think that's that's really important. The other thing I will say is start with the science. You know, we're really lucky here in New York City to um, work with an independent panel of climate scientists that are actually appointed by the mayor that are required to provide us our local climate projections every three years. And these climate mm -hmm. projections provide the basis of our entire climate resiliency portfolio. Um, and you know, it, it, it's, it's really important that we have this authoritative and reliable science at our disposal, but also that it's consensus based, that there aren't disputes among the scientific community about what science we should be starting with. So consider engaging the scientists in your cities um, to, to do something similar. I think that it's a really important starting place uh, to engage in this kind of work. And I love what you just said about having the three-year progress reports, because I'm sure many of us were, at, were wanting to know what are some of the measures put in place in order to keep progressing towards achieving the goal. So thank you for saying that. And the next question that I have here from the chat is, how is this relevant to other cities in the world in terms of either the plan itself or um, just the conversation about climate change and how it's impacting us? Well, every city is going to be facing some uh, uh, some kind of impacts from climate change. It'll be different based on where you are and and um, what specifically those climate how those specifically climate change will play out in your community. But every city is going to be um, impacted in some way. Um, you know, I think New York City is um, uh, in a in a really um, a unique position here because we've got mm -hmm. access to resources to really, uh, you know, lead the way. Um, but I hope that other cities will come to New York and engage us in how we can be helpful. We're really excited to be able to engage with other cities, um, not only to export some of the lessons that we've learned because we don't, you know, we've certainly made mistakes along the way and we don't want other cities to have to go through those same experiences. We want to be able to share the lessons we've learned so that other cities have a head start in many ways. Um, but we also want to learn from the lessons that other cities are experiencing. A great example of this is we've had a great partnership with Copenhagen um, around intense precipitation. Since a lot of our work started with, um, you know, started after Hurricane Sandy was really kicked off by this huge coastal storm, we haven't been um, as focused on intense precipitation until more recently, but it's a certainly a risk that New York City faces. Whereas Copenhagen experienced a very large intense precipitation event in 2011. And so they had lessons from that that they could share with us. So we've been in, in the middle of an exchange where we're uh, uh, you know, sharing our lessons um, around coastal resiliency with Copenhagen while they share their lessons around extreme rain events. Um, and we'd love to continue those kinds of partnerships with other cities. That is so beautiful to hear. Uh, another question that we have here in the chat is, uh, what can young people do to take action? And how can someone who's inspired follow in your footsteps, Janie? Well, um, thank you for that question. I, you know, I'm, I'm so glad that young people are asking about how they can take action. I think that it's been so inspiring to see the youth movements recently around climate change. I think the focus has been very much on decarbonization and we must continue to decarbonize um, and curb the rate of climate change. But we also have to recognize that some of the impacts of climate change are already locked in. That's why we saw the most active Atlantic Ocean a hurricane season on record last year. We saw one of the hottest years on record, only a hundredth of a degree cooler than, than the hottest year on record, 2016. Um, so these climate change impacts, um, you know, so, some of these climate change impacts we cannot avoid. Um, so let's also frame climate adaptation, climate resilience as an essential form of climate action. Um, we absolutely have to uh, start preparing for these impacts so that we can continue to um, thrive in our communities, thrive in the face of climate change, um, and also use the action and investments that we are taking to create better quality of life, to create more equitable places to live. 
Um, and in terms of this field, you know, resilience is quite an emerging field. Um, there are so many entry points. Don't feel like you have to study a particular uh, field in order to get get to um, a, a role in resilience. Um, we need people who are experts in finance, in planning, in infrastructure, in facilitation. A lot of this work is about being able to bring people um, in different disciplines together to have productive conversations and explore joint solutions. So there are many different entry points. Um, just continue following the work, continue your passion, um, and I'm sure that there will be a place for you. Oh my goodness, Janie, I just want to thank you so much for this Q&A. Um, I have to say that this conversation and also Mrs. Nui's remarks reminded me of the ways that we as individuals can come together to provide solutions to issues of climate change and access to safe water. And I just want to say really quickly that if you see in my background, you'll see a part but together for change. And it just made me think about that, the words that you shared. So thank you so much um, for contributing to today's discussion. Thank you, Karen. Um, and I also want to say that um, due to the number of questions that we have, we're going to answer some of these questions offline as well. So please don't think that this is the last time that you can have an, a response to your question, um, but we do have to move on to the next segment of this amazing panel. So with that being said, I'm so excited to bring on our next speaker, who's Gayatri Chawan. Gayatri uh, comes with more than a decade of experience leading sustainability efforts in the corporate sector. Uh, following that, she founded Buzz on Earth, a leading hub that commands audiences from 190 countries and has made it to the coveted list of top 10 sustainability YouTube channel globally, number one in India in 2020. Welcome, Gayatri. Thank you, Cairo. Thanks a lot. So um, thanks uh, Safe Water Network for inviting me over. And uh, I would also uh, like to mention that it is pertinent that I'm really thrilled to be sharing this panel with such accomplished and uh, experienced professionals uh, like Ms. Indra Noe and Mr. Paramayar. Uh, a big hello and thank you to all the people who are there in the audiences. And uh, this is really uh, thrilling to see the kind of time everyone is making to address this vital topic. Thank you, Safe Water Network, once again, for uh, hosting this uh, conference. I'm going to keep this really short and uh, would like to convey my message into three points. And the first one is that of uh, restoring ecological balance and water cycle. So this image that you see in front of you, um, it conveys a lot. However, uh, the point that I want to make is this, that uh, forest ecosystems are really, really fundamental to maintaining the water cycle. And we know that today is World Water Day. Uh, what was the day yesterday? Yesterday was International Day for Forests. And there is a reason why these two days are almost placed consecutively. And the reason is clear in front of you that forests do play a very, very critical role. And uh, the reason why I want to bring this up is also to mention that this is one area where we can actually get corporates and communities to come together and create a massive difference. So at Buzz on Earth, we had uh, started this initiative. It is called Mission Prakriti. Um, Prakriti in Sanskrit, it means, uh, you know, nature. So Mission Prakriti can be interpreted as Mission Nature. And here we are trying to, you know, create uh, multi-layered food forests. And that's a social forestry model because the uh, benefits of this model are uh, reaped by the underprivileged communities and farmers and the ecology to the most. So the amount of carbon that we sequester through this is close to 15 to 20 kgs per square meter. And as it goes with the forest, the amount of uh, water that they absorb through the roots, take it to the aquifers, recharge the water tables, it is all uh, you know, totally significant to adding to the uh, balancing of water cycle. And also uh, the carbon that is trapped into the soil because the kind of species that we are using, we are using multi layered uh, farming techniques where we have tubers, climbers, creepers, uh, pollination trees, fruiting trees. So all sorts of plants that you will see in a forest ecosystem, we try to replicate that. And of course, uh, this is pertinent to mention here that planting forests of any kind or any scale will not really help you restore the water balance. For, uh, for it to have immediate and good effects, you need to have the right kind of scale and the right kind of species that should be uh, planted. And here we are talking about forest scale of more than 500 acres. And this need not be you know, consecutive. It can be in different, different uh, pieces. 
but currently we are working on close to 2000 acres of land parcel and these are barren land parcels in cities and farms where we are actually uh, spotting them and converting them into forests so as i said we are mimicking the way a forest really looks like and behaves and this impacts the overall uh, water ecosystem of the place because there are uh, dying lakes, dying uh, water ecosystems from the river, which get rejuvenated uh, by this afforestation activity. So this is very important. And uh, as I mentioned, the carbon that gets trapped in the soil, that's very important. Because if you look at uh, the rainfall, um, when the rainfall comes, about 15% of that goes into aquifers, about 15% say goes into the runoff. But remaining 70 to 75 percent of water is actually trapped in the soil and how much water can be trapped in the soil that really connects to the amount of carbon content in the soil. So this is what we really focus on and we are ensuring that we actually retain the, uh, we enhance the retention capacity of the soil by using this technique of creating such forests. These are man-made forests but they actually help, uh, you know, with every sense in creating and recreating the original ecosystems. So that's number one. The second point that I wanted to make, uh, that is about how we can use the behavioral change as a tool. So we don't need these slides uh, anymore, uh, actually, because the second point is this I wanted to show only for the forest ecosystem. The second point that I want to make is about the behavioral change, which is really, really important. And especially when we are talking about individual level and community level behavioral changes. I'm not even uh, touching upon the macro level changes like uh, rejuvenating rivers and lakes. I'm not touching upon that. At the community and individual levels, there are several things that an individual can do. And uh, one of the things, for example, could be rainwater harvesting. And I want to give a small example about the power of rainwater harvesting, how it can be uh, felt and uh, realized. Um, I live in the city of Bangalore in India, and uh, our city receives close to 960 mm uh, of rainfall every year. So this is how the precipitation is measured. And if you look at a regular household, uh, say a rooftop of 100 square meter, so that makes it a pallet which can probably contain 960 mm into 100 square meter, that makes it close to 96,000 or 97,000. You can approximate it to 100,000 liters of water annually. So that is the kind of water which is available to you from nature just by you know, harvesting rain itself. And that is good enough to sustain a family of four to five for eight to 10 uh, months. So this is the power of a simple behavioral change that is rainwater harvesting, which is probably mandated by governments in certain regions, but not in every um, other area. Second is that of uh, reusing water as much as possible. So there are you know, technologies available and there are manual interventions to which you could do that at apartments and office complexes. It is pretty much a standard practice, but how we could do that at an individual and residential level that you can always figure out. Third is how we can use uh, fixtures and you know, uh, such technologies that can improve the water efficiency, whether you are using aerators or you are using cell faucets which are having a low flow rate all of that really helps you with the uh, reduction of demand. And reduction of demand is really very important point, And I'm emphasizing that as the most important one in this whole series, because uh, that has a multiplier effect. If you multiply, if you're able to reduce the demand by 50% for one person, just multiply that with the population that the world has. So that is the power of multiplier effect when, when we come to reduce the demand. And uh, freshwater reserve, as we all know, is really limited. So this is very important for us to consider. And the third point that uh, is very uh, nicely put up by Indra Nui as well, that is the power of young change makers. And here, uh, as my role goes with Ashoka, Ashoka is an organization that connects the young change makers from all around the world. And also our work with India Model United Nations, which is India's force of 1 million youth coming together to voice their uh, concerns for planet and climate change. Uh, I would just uh, say one thing that if we bring technology, media and youth together, then you see the magic. And this magic is really uh, so inspiring to see because they are the ones who are really hands-on with technology. They are the ones who are really good with leveraging media to the best extent. And then it is only the effect of you know, creating the amplification of the impact that happens in one place. Otherwise, if you talk about solutions, Solutions are really uh, in ample. I would say every single region might have one or two solutions for most of the problems that we are facing on climate change. But then these 
people and these solution providers are working in silos. And we need a system systems approach. We need an ecosystem approach in order to bring together all these change makers to connect the dots and to ensure that all of these forces are able to result in a massive impact. So climate change and resilience is something which really needs uh, effective force and it requires people from all around the world to come together. And Ashoka believes in this, that everyone has to be a change maker and everyone can be a change maker. So with that, um, I would like to part the young people in this group with this thought that if you are willing, if you are connected, in fact, in India MUN, one of the things that we are doing is that we are connecting these young people with the uh, tech giants and we are giving them access to technology. So this technology they can use in order to solve the sustainable uh, or climate change related problems. So uh, put together all of these three points, as I summarized once again, that is, um, um, restoring ecological balance in water cycle, then getting behavioral change uh, with uh, water demand reduction. And the third is about uh, leveraging the power of youth. So thank you so much. I would like to summarize with one quote from Leonardo da Vinci and uh, thanks to Save Water Network again. Water is the driving force for all nature. So let us believe in the value of water. That is the theme of this year's Water Day. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And, and we have a question um, specifically from Kwabina, um, who says, mm -hmm. in my com community, we have over five acres of forest. The same forest provides some part of the community with drinking water, but people within the community are polluting the forest by doing all types of unfriendly things to the forest. What can we okay. do to protect this forest? I'm gonna ask if you can give us a succinct answer um, to Kwabina's question, thank you. Sure, uh, that's a great question. And in order to protect the water from polluting, uh, you know, what, what can be done by the uh, people who are conserving the forest, they can actually create some sort of uh, barricading or they can create some sort of awareness. And because most of these things have to be worked out in terms of education and awareness, which has really worked well in the places that we have worked, because then farmers own the lands, farmers own the forest, farmers own the water bodies that are, you know, protected within the forest. So once you make them the owner, once they realize that it is their uh, own water body, their own forest, then they will be more, uh, you know, careful about protecting it. Thank you so much, Gayatri. Um, now we will have an amazing young leader coming to us all the way from New Zealand. Ewan Wong is an accomplished poet, innovator, and community builder. She's the founder of PSR Beaches and the winner of the 2020 National Schools Poetry Award, as well as Bo Seats, future Blue Youth Council member. One degree, waves ebb and flow, oscillating and absent patterns. Clearing the sounds of silent alarm. Factory fumes tease the waters like a barista concocts latte art. The product, a burdened atmosphere, wrapped in a cover page aesthetic. Two degrees. On the exposed coast, footprints are littered with CO2. Wrapped in a thick foam and salty tears, waves brush against our feet, lapping at our ankles, but we are still watching as nature's artists paint our beaches. Tracks of convenience, designed with a greenhouse palette, marbled on a changing canvas. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Ewan Wong. I'm an emerging poet and an environmental advocate based in Christchurch, New Zealand. I chose to open with the first two parts of my six part poem, Six Degrees, which I believe encapsulates and encompasses my connection with Fauci. Six Degrees bridges the gap between art and science by incorporating scientific knowledge specifically around the impacts of each of the six degrees of global temperature rise within the poetic context. And this bridge between art and science 
is something that Southeat is strengthening every day by providing an innovative space for teams to connect, create, and communicate for our ocean. But why is this bridge so important? How can it help to address the climate and water issues facing us today? For many, climate change is difficult to picture. It isn't like a flood, a rapid onset hazard, one which we plaster with the patterns of destruction. Arctic sea ice coverage has shrunk every decade since 1979, yet it fails to draw media attention to the scale of one earthquake. 30 seconds beats 30 years, because unlike an earthquake travelling at 10 kilometres per second, climate change is slow onset, somewhat predictable, and accompanied by fair warning. And when something so pertinent is difficult to picture, we begin to widen an already massive disconnect between science and public knowledge. But when we bridge art and science, we are encouraged to think creatively, to combine rationality and emotionality, the heart and the mind. We start to form our own literal and figurative pictures. In the past, the merger between science and art has been used to explain the world around us through scientific illustration. Today, this merger provides an opportunity to challenge our preconceptions, to reach a large audience and create an environment where we are always questioning, always changing and always acting. My journey with Bouty has included four years of participation through poetry, prose, and practical action. Organizing a plastic pollution conference for young people in my community and establishing an organization which drives beach cleanups, tree plantings, and educational initiatives relating to our ocean. This year, I've been fortunate enough to be on Bowsey's Future Blue Youth Council, collaborating with other young people to create by youth for youth initiatives, which focus on protecting our oceans. And this leads me to a concluding and guiding point. Too often we lose ourselves in statistics and complex science and forget the weight of our individual actions. How can we frame these climate and water issues in a way that resonates with our community? Over the course of this talk, I have cycled through a selection of past entries into Bowsey's Ocean Awareness Contest. There are so many more. I encourage you or young people you know to engage with Bowsey or explore the amazing art which young people around the world have created. Let us reshape our carbon footprints into shoes to walk by oceans. Then sprint, because the climate is running, it is changing, and our change must match it. Thank you. Oh my goodness, Yuen Wong, I got goosebumps. That piece that you did was quite remarkable. Now moving on to Rani Imandi. Uh, Rani Imandi is an accomplished immigration attorney and a staunch supporter of Safe Water Network. Rani, you have the floor. Hi, uh, hi, thank you very much, Cairo, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to work with Safe Water Network and participate in this amazing and inspirational event today, which is World Water Day. As we recognize the importance of access to water for to obtain social equality. It is absolutely essential to support such an amazing organization such as Safe Water. Um, my firm, Imandi Law Firm, has been committed to, uh, to work with Safe Water and support it, and especially because it's so important to give access to water to the critical, crit to youth across the world and communities. So uh, I just want to encourage safe water and thank you for the opportunity to share, enable, and encourage 
others to support such a noble cause. And uh, thank you for this opportunity and I will continue to support it. Wonderful, thank you so much, Rani. And now we will have a special premiere of a special video in celebration for World Water Day. When water flows, life prospers. When water stops, so does life. Population growth, climate change, conflict. Such forces consume water at alarming rates. What then is the value of water? A mother who walks six kilometers to fetch water for her family. She knows its value. A doctor whose clinic faces a COVID crisis. He knows its value. A teacher in a remote village whose students are too often sick. She knows its value. And a farmer whose crops are always thirsty. He knows its value too. Nearly two billion people around the world will wake up this very morning without safe water. These families know its value all too well. When you don't have safe water, its value, priceless. Safe water, essential health. Hello everyone, uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, wherever you are. Thank you for joining. It's been, uh, it's been amazing uh, uh, conversations and inspiration and, and storytelling all along. And uh, I'm, I'm so uh, honored uh, to be introducing our next speaker. My name is Venki Raghavendra. I work with Safe Water Network. Uh, and my guest today, and our guest today is uh, Mr. Parameswaran Nair, Mr. Param Iyer. Welcome to the program, sir. Uh, thank you for joining us. And, and I do know that uh, today is an extremely busy day on World Water Day uh, in, your, in your role uh, at the World Bank, uh, leading the global strategic initiatives for water. It's a, it's a packed day, but thank you for making time to engage with the youth audience around the world. We are very, very honored to have you. But uh, before before I start uh, engaging with you in our in our brief conversation, uh, really uh, your role as uh, Secretary Government of India before you return to the World Bank, leading the Swachh Bharat Mission, uh, the brainchild of Prime Minister Modi, to really spawn this amazing uh, revolution across the country of across India uh, on you know on on this sanitation revolution. So kudos to you and the team. Uh, so really, uh, it's it's such an inspiring story. So. So welcome to the program, uh, Mr. Iyer, uh, and um, let me start with the uh, Swachh Bharat Mission. You know, it is a, it was a very very big dream. It was a very very big uh, mission. Uh, can you just give us the contours of that mission and 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 how you went about uh, really tackling on such a such a big uh, big issue of sanitation across a country of 1.2 billion people? Sure. Thank you, Mickey, and it's a pleasure to join uh, the Safe Water Network and this fa fascinating event with so many youngsters connected from around the world, including from India, I understand. And as you mentioned, the Swachh Bharat mission, the brainchild, uh, the vision of Prime Minister Modi was a very big idea uh, to start with, right? You know, he threw out this idea uh, on 15th August, 2014 in his first Independence Day speech at a time when uh, the importance of sustainable development goal number six was never more important than before. Mm -hmm. With over a billion people in the world at that time practicing open defecation and having unsafe sanitation, with 60% of that number being in India. So you wanted to understand the scale. So there were more than 550 million people at that time who were defecating in the open because they had no access to safe sanitation. And Prime Minister Modi decided that he would fix his problem in a short period of five years. So at that time, 
the sanitation coverage in India was less than 40%, and it had to get to 100% in just about five years. So he threw out that big vision, and he was very keen that it becomes what in Hindi we call a Jan Andolan, the people's movement. And youth really had to play a critical role in that, whether it was school kids, school girls, whether it was young professionals, grassroots, motivators, or even the young professionals we put in the field uh, in every district. So it had to become a people's movement because behavior had to be changed, right? It was not just about building toilets, although more than 100 million were built mm -hmm. in terms of numbers, but it was how do you get people to change their behavior to understand the importance of practicing safe sanitation from a health perspective, from an economic perspective, and even from an environmental perspective, which is particularly important in today's water and climate focused world. So that movement, I was very privileged to be the secretary in the government of India, uh, mm -hmm. heading that mission and working together with state governments, with districts, uh, with young people all across the board. And I think there is, a, a, we need to acknowledge the role which youth in particular play in making that a people's movement in India. Wow, thank you. No, uh, you know, the words of scale and impact and exponential impact, these are all thrown around in the sector a lot, but really to imagine half a billion people, uh, more than 500 million people, their attitudes, their behaviors were changed. What would you pinpoint as the levers of change, Mr. Ayer? Sure. You know, as you said, Venki, uh, you know, in India, it was a cultural practice also, right? To defecate in the open, so behavior. And sometimes there were stigmas around having a toilet inside your house. You know, mm -hmm. Some people believe that itself was not a desirable practice. So a lot of mental models needed to be changed and it had to be done at scale, right? This was mm -hmm. not being done on a pilot basis. So behavior change at scale meant that you had to go all the way from mass media uh, using you know Bollywood stars, cricketing stars to put out the message. Like we had Amitabh Bachchan, Akshay Kumar, Sachin Tendulkar coming out, wow. spreading the good word. But on the mm -hmm. ground, you needed to have people who understood what triggers behavior change. The word triggering came into the jargon. Interpersonal mm -hmm. communication. Do you use disgust? Do you use uh, you know love? Do you use economic benefit? And every context was slightly different. So what triggered behavior change? We had to get into the science of that. And uh, in, in different places, whether it was school kids and school girls, you know, acting as ambassadors and motivating their teachers and their parents to build toilets and to get the entire community to get that social pressure moving, that our village will be clean and we will not allow anyone to defecate out. So that movement, that mobilization. And of course, we were lucky that Prime Minister Modi was our communicator in chief. Yeah. No, thank you. No, but it's 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 remarkable what you describe, and it's very hard to encapsulate in what what was done over over five 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 years in in a in a country of 1.2 billion population in two minutes. But but just you know, given that we have so many young people around the world tuned in, and who will also be seeing this later as well, uh, how did you how did you woo them, and how did you get them on board as your allies? You alluded to that a little bit, but can you elaborate on that a uh, little bit, Mr. Ayer? Sure, you know, I think for a mass movement like this, without the integral role of young people and youth and school kids, I don't think this would have been possible. So we did a couple of things which sort of institutionalized the involvement of youth. For mm -hmm. one, we had the Tata Trust was very kind and that was a partnership which led to huge results. They recruited and deployed over 500 young professionals, put one in each district in the field Mm -hmm. They became the eyes and ears of the collector. So many of the youngsters who were keen just to be part of a national program to look at development on the ground. So that was one way we put them in. They became our eyes and ears as well in the ministry in Delhi. In addition to that, we had what we call the Swacha Grahis, the grassroots motivators, youth at the village level. So every village community had a youngster, at least you know, about half of them were women and girls. We got them involved. So their job was to go out, they were trained in behavior change techniques, and then they went out and triggered behavior change. Then we had school kids. We had, you know, school girls coming out, getting out into processions. And I think, in, and in my own team in the ministry, you know, we brought in a lot of young professionals as well. So I think it's an important role which youth played across the board. 
in terms of innovation, in terms of sparking of new ideas, in terms of you know, challenging the status quo in the field in particular, uh, it made a very, very big difference. Thank you. No, I, I think it, it sounds like you really empowered them and you know, put them in charge of actually uh, facilitating and enabling this change. And that's what, that's been the consistent theme uh, all through the program today as well. Uh, before, a uh, couple of quick things before I let you go. One is there are, again, these young people, you know, uh, Safe Water Network is privileged to have literally thousands of young people in our folds who, who, who aspire to make change, who are already making change. Uh, I know there are always challenges, uh, barriers, and other other things that they need to encounter. What is what is your one mantra? What's your one uh, uh, if secret advice or something that you would tell them or inspiration that you would give them at this moment? Sure, uh, you know maybe just two, and you know it's sort of partly reflected in the in the book I recently written as a pro tip. I think the first is you need to dare to dream. Uh, you know when you're young, you need to think very big. There's nothing which you cannot do. And the second point is you need to seize the moment. You know, there's a Latin phrase called carpe diem. When an opportunity presents itself, don't let it go. And never be afraid to take risks, particularly when you're young. Uh, there's a little chapter called blunder when you're younger in my book. Yeah? And mm -hmm. you know, I made a lot of mistakes when I was uh, you know, the age of the youngsters who are joining this. So don't worry about making mistakes, get out there, the you know development is a fabulous sector, but whatever you're doing, think big, seize the moment, and take risks. That's that's very well put, uh, uh, Mr. Ayer. I'm a proud I'm a proud owner of of your book, and uh, I still need to get your autograph. But talking of which, uh, you know your the title is very aptly method in the madness. I think I think all change makers need to be a little mad to to make that change happen. Um, no, but uh, you already alluded to that. The pro tips that you have given, I think uh, your book talks about various uh, various professional tips and 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 learning moments and 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 tools that 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 youngsters need to develop in their professional career, especially in the development sector. But on a you know on a busy World Water Day, so wonderful to have you join us and share your share your journey a little bit with us, and we hope to stay connected with you, Mr. Ayer. Uh, have a wonderful World Water Day, and thank you for your uh, for for all that you do, and uh, uh, have a great day, Mr. Ayer. Thanks very much, Venkia. Real pleasure to join you and all the youngsters around the world. So a happy World Water Day to everybody, and have a great rest of the session. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Cairo, back to you, uh, uh, the hostess of the program. Thank you. Thank you. I have to say what an incredible event this has been so far. And I know I'm not the only one to feel this way, especially after hearing the enlightening interview between Venki and Param. I'm going to remember that, Param, you need to dare to dream and remember to seize the day. I hope everyone wrote that down. It's truly invigorating to see so many action-oriented and innovative people coming together from all parts of the world. I'm so inspired by the speakers and active discussions around the universal and fundamental need for clean water. And just like water, there's a universal need for music and art to give expression to the human spirit. And who better to bring that to us than Mohit Chauhan, who is a singer, songwriter, composer, well known in the world of Bollywood. He is a two time recipient of the International DAF Bama Award, a two time recipient of the Film Fair Award for Best Male Playback Singer, and a three time recipient of Z Sin Award. Congratulations, we cannot wait to hear you. Hi, this is Mohit Chauhan, and I want to thank uh, Safe Water Network for inviting me to this wonderful event. I've heard that uh, this organization was started by Mr. Paul Newman, the famous Hollywood actor, and it has been at the forefront of enabling access to safe drinking water across communities across the world. I know that there are many, many passionate uh, youngsters who are bringing their enthusiasm and talent uh, to this organization. As we all know that this is a time that we have to take action for water and climate. These are some of the biggest challenges that we face today. And the cause of environment is really close to me, uh, to my heart, because I myself come from a, a mountain state, a Himalayan mountain state of Himachal Pradesh, from the northwestern part of India. And uh, growing up, uh, with rivers and beautiful forests around, around me when I was in school and college, uh, I sensed the importance 
uh, of preserving uh, nature, our forest, our trees. Uh, that's how we're going to have water in abundance for our future generations. You know. So I really want to thank Safe Water Network uh, for this wonderful uh, initiative that they're carrying on with, and uh, I hope to stay connected with the uh, Safe Water Network in future with all the passionate youngsters uh, out there. And I hope you enjoy my song. Thank you. Thank you.
My goodness, Mohit, your performance was so lovely. The song that we just listened to for everyone who's listening in is a prayer and speaks to the source of all of India's water. I actually remember going to Rishikesh in India and seeing the Ganges River and the song in this video so eloquently expressed the beauty of this water source. So as we now wrap up our event, I'd like to bring on Marissa Jaffa, one of the event's organizers. Let's take a look at her special message and performance. <laughs> Hi everyone, this has been such an amazing event. I will not be performing, but I will be thanking everybody. Um, so I'm so happy to have had the opportunity to help bring everyone together near and far um, who will undoubtedly shape the future of our planet. Cairo, big thank you to you for being so wonderful. Our sponsor is Linda Cabot from BOSI, um, Rani Amandi from Amandi Law Firm. Thank you Divya Gupta from Grids Consulting for all your support. Um, the entire Safe Water Network team, including my wonderful colleagues, thank you, Raghavendra and Dan Bena. And of course, a big, big thank you to Safe Water Network's Youth Steering Group for keeping us motivated and energized week after week. So keep on coming and follow us on social media to stay up to date with our work and future events. Thank you so much. Over to you, Cairo. Thank you. All right. So I want to thank you um, to our speakers, our panelists and partners. Thank you so much for being a part of this event and making it quite incredible. I also want to thank New, um, India News as well as, um, let's see, I want to thank News India Times, excuse me, ITV Gold, TV Asia and Yoshida Singh from Press Trust of India, who is also the chief correspondent for United Nations New York. And please be sure to stay tuned and join us in our other upcoming events as part of the Safe Waters Network's virtual webinar series. Thank you.